It's repositioned, restored, and ready to make a comeback in downtown Las Vegas. The Silver Slipper is the shining beacon drawing people to the newly opened Neon Museum. And tonight, we'll take you inside the landmark, paying tribute to the evolution of this city we call home. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Shauna Karami. And I'm Kale Remaker. In tonight's special Lighting Las Vegas, we're going to show you some of the iconic neon signs that put Las Vegas on the map, making it a glowing mecca in the desert. From this historic welcome center to one of the designers behind the signs, we're going to take you through the two acres they make up one of the largest collections in the world of neon signage. 20 years in the making, the boneyard was officially lit back in October. And what you're seeing is 70 years worth of vintage signs. The night before the big grand opening on October 27th, the museum held a vintage Vegas party, complete with a nighttime look at the neon signs and people dressed in vintage clothing. on Boneyard for Tours, this is where it all begins, in front of the Golden Nuggets old sign, and it celebrates the year that Las Vegas became a city, 1905. So what better way than to start our look back at the history of neon? Here's reporter Lauren Rosella. For decades, neon has lit up the Las Vegas skyline, turning night into day. Since its creation, neon has enchanted people for years as it's taken the form of every shape and color imaginable. Today, the sign remains the only remnants of an otherwise obsolete time period. They get people to tell their own stories. These signs don't just have one story to tell, they have multiple stories from everybody who's ever been there. Neon arrived in Nevada in the 1920s, just after the first highways were built. Signs began lighting up Los Angeles Highway, later known as the Strip in the 1950s and 60s. During the 60s, the, the time period that really people think about when they think about Las Vegas, that's when really some of our most iconic signs were, were built and, and displayed on the Strip. While there was less demand for neon across the country in the 1950s, Las Vegas decided to capitalize. Vegas was really at its heyday at that time, and uh, the role of the neon sign for this city it was really unlike anywhere else. Each sign is full of personal touches to make it unique. The iconic Silver Slipper contains more than 900 incandescent light bulbs. It now sits fully restored above the boneyard. The Flame Restaurant sign lit the way for regulars like Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack to dine inside. Aladdin's lamp went up in 1966, showcasing a revolving lighted genie's lamp, a glowing welcome for tourists in the new hotel. There's nothing like them anywhere else in the country. And they were art. They were expressing the times and American values like power and light and uh, uh, the relationship to the desert, to nature. The sign became the signifier for the building, you know, for the theme of the place, of the fantasy that was happening inside the casino. Throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, architecture on the Strip started to change. Casino owners started making the buildings themselves the focus, no longer the signs. Today, the Neon Boneyard is all that's left to tell their stories. There are some really historic problems properties like the Moulin Rouge, the Stardust Hotel, the Desert Inn that do not exist anymore. And the only thing left are these iconic signs that lured people into these wonderful places. The digital age of computers took over, making older signs obsolete. Signs using LED and LCD lighting became more energy efficient, using a fraction of the electricity. Today it's much more of a commercial uh, aspect to it, simply becoming larger, becoming more crowded, and not having the sort of artistic focus that the original signs did. Today, Neon remains a powerful force in renewing the nostalgia of a lost age, making Las Vegas a magical place to leave the everyday and escape to the extraordinary. Lauren Rosella, 8 News Now. Some of these signs aren't just historical themselves, they represent a changing point in Nevada's history. The Moulin Rouge is one of those examples. It was the first racially integrated hotel in Las Vegas. It opened back in 1955 as the first local casino to welcome both blacks and whites. And it played host to headliners including Sammy Davis Jr., Nat King Cole, and Frank Sinatra. It was badly damaged in a fire in 2003 and was finally torn down in 2010. Now the signature sign is all that's left 
of an important piece of our history. Another piece of our history also represents a significant change in architecture. We're talking about the iconic La Concha Hotel, and it was no easy feat trying to save that hotel from being lost forever. The engineering genius it took to take apart and move the hotel lobby and the vital role it now plays in the Neon Boneyard when Lighty Las Vegas returns. Hi, and welcome back to Lighting Las Vegas. I'm standing in front of the Neon Boneyards Visitor Center, and if this looks familiar, it's because it is. This is the original restored lobby from the La Concha Motel, originally built in 1961. It stood next to where the Riviera now stands today. It was set to be demolished in 2005, but the owners agreed to donate it to the Neon Museum. Our cameras were there as it was moved from its spot along Las Vegas Boulevard. Grant funding allowed the original shell to be restored in 2008. And Aaron Drawhorn takes us inside the history of the La Concha. The La Concha is the centerpiece of the Neon Museum. Visitors first walk into what was the motel's lobby, their first steps in reliving Las Vegas history. This is really the city's identity. When people think of Las Vegas, they think of the sign. Architect Pat Klink says neon signs are all a symbol of Las Vegas. But what makes the La Concha special, he says, its shell shape is a sign in itself. The La Concha is one of the better examples of Googie architecture here in Las Vegas. Googie architecture represented the space age, the atomic age, and the car culture. Paul Revere Williams, a legend in architecture, designed the La Concha. For 42 years, this small property named after the Spanish resort community was Las Vegas' most notable example of Googie architecture. It's a populist architecture. It struck a chord with the people of the, the 50s. The La Concha was open here from 1961 to 2003, known for its modern architecture. In a city infamous for dramatic implosions, the history of this small motel was preserved, taking a short trip up Las Vegas Boulevard. In danger of meeting the wrecking ball, over a million bucks was shelled out to move the La Concha and its arches. Movers loaded up the building that set itself apart on the strip so it could be preserved at the Neon Museum. Because the original building had a whole motel attached to the back of it, it was fairly stable. Out here at uh, when they, they moved it, you didn't have that motel, so the building had a tendency to turn, fall over. Moving the La Concha was an engineering feat. And you can see some of the lines coming across here. Uh, the shell was cut into eight different pieces. Crews had to attach a cement anchor on the back during the move to make sure it didn't topple. And today, that anchor sits underground and behind the lobby to keep it upright. And behind that anchor, the rest of the visitor center that Klink himself designed. Today, the La Concha's original sign at the front desk greets visitors to the Neon Museum. It's uh, backlit, and so at night it has a nice glow to it. Historians are pleased Las Vegas can now shed light on its bright past. To save the signs and the La Concha lobby uh, is just a great sign for the future uh, in honoring these buildings. And for Pat Klink, he's glad the La Concha and all of these signs are here not to die, but to live on. After living here for 35 years, it is really heartening to see the city save bits and pieces of its history. Aaron Drawhorn, 8 News Now. While the La Concha got attention from its very unique design, other hotels use gimmicky designs to draw in visitors. Designs like this lamp here. Take a look at it. It's absolutely huge. But when it sat on top of the Aladdin, it actually looked pretty small. But the Neon Creations got your attention, serving as a beacon in an otherwise dark desert. And while the shapes and designs have changed throughout the years, the glowing lights identify our city. That unique and changing architecture can be seen in all of the Boneyard signs. From Sassy Sally's to one of many Binion's horseshoe signs, each one has a story to tell. And we're going to take you through some of those stories with your own sneak peek of everything you can see here at the Boneyard when our special Lighty Las Vegas continues. Welcome 
Welcome back to Lighting Las Vegas. I've got Mr. Bill Marion here with me. He is the chairman of the board for the Neon Museum, and he's joining me here in the Boneyard. Well, I want to get to a little bit of the history of Las Vegas here. Well, you know, Las Vegas reinvents itself almost every decade, and we don't treasure or keep those remnants of our past. We blow up those buildings and build new ones on top of them. Mm -hmm. So these signs are all that's left of some truly historic buildings that really made Las Vegas what it is today. Yeah, like the Stardust the right Stardust here. The Stardust is I a mean, great amazing. example. You may remember the Stardust sign was huge. It was 300 feet long and something like 30 feet tall. Yeah. The reason for that was because the buildings in back were really not very attractive. So they put this sign up. It was a, an advertisement for the building. It set the theme for the hotel, but it also hid the buildings. Today, there's computer, computers that you do sign design in. Sure. Most of these were hand-drawn and then had to be translated into wow. an engineering design and then had to actually be built and manufactured. The neon glass itself was hand-blown and hand-molded. I had to ask you about this Tropicana mobile park now is this part of the Tropicana Hotel was this a separate it, mobile park it, area or something it is it? separate it's basically named after the street Tropicana Boulevard gotcha. and one of the things that we've done with the boneyard is it's not just about signs that are related to casinos or properties mm -hmm. they're also signs that reflect other areas of Las Vegas's history as well and then secondly, you'll see that the vast majority of these signs have not been restored. That's intentional because there's something about them in their rustic state that makes them very interesting to look at. I mean, a photographer's dream is to walk through here and spend time capturing the different light, the different colors, the different shadow effects. Uh, I think it is impossible to take a bad photograph in the bone house. I gotta ask you about this guy here. <laughs> He's uh, obviously playing pool. What is this one from? Too? This is actually the pool player from the old Doc and Eddie's pool hall, which was uh, right near the strip. And he kind of adds this personal touch so that as you look at him, you're kind of looking at the boneyard from his perspective. This is the Yucca Motel sign. And again, this is an example of how a small property on the strip could actually afford a really intricate and elaborate sign. If you look at the yucca flowering up here, all of that tubing had to be hand molded, mm -hmm. hand designed, mm -hmm. and, and just the intricacy of the work shows the craftsmanship and the level of craftsmanship that was necessary to both design and create these signs. That's, that's really art. And then the Moulin Rouge, of course. The oh. Moulin Rouge is one of the, the great things about this sign, first of all, and it's when you walk through the boneyard, you'll notice that these signs are huge. They don't, this is a, this one really spans It's, it's a, a lot. big sign. You don't think of them as being that big because you normally see them from a distance. And so the, the scale that you have, you're looking at them differently. Then when you come here and you see, my goodness, how huge mm -hmm. these signs really are. The Moulin Rouge was built in 1955. It was the first integrated casino and resort in Las Vegas. It was built in the West Las Vegas area. Uh, in those days, in 1955, if you were a black entertainer on the Strip, you couldn't eat at the property that you were performing at, and you couldn't stay at that property. So a lot of those entertainers had to stay in boarding houses in West Las Vegas. Well, the Moulin Rouge opened up, uh, very insightful to do that, in order to create an integrated casino. Well, the interesting thing about it was that at 2 o'clock in the morning when the lounge shows would end on the Strip, those performers would head over to the Moulin Rouge because that's where they'd be staying, and they'd do jam sessions. I was going to say, it must have been such a happening place to be, it, all the musicians in one area. Well, but guess what followed? The gamblers wanting to keep partying <laughs> followed the musicians over to the Moulin Rouge. Everybody's at the Moulin Rouge. Everybody's <laughs> over there. Well, get the owners of the properties on the Strip weren't real happy about that. So there uh -huh. are stories that they may have done some things in order Order to force the closure of the Moulin Rouge. But this is part of the famous H wall at the Horseshoe Hotel. There were actually three pieces of this. So imagine the bull nose in front of the horseshoe, that these would be three stacked on top of each other uh -huh. that would welcome you into the front doors of the Horseshoe Hotel. So again, the, these lights would all light up and it was this brilliant uh, yellow flashing lights that would flicker on and off and create this just amazing uh, image for the hotel. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today and showing us around the Boneyard. It has been a really great, fun, 
experience. I think everyone should definitely experience it at least once. Well, we're thrilled to have you here, and we look Thanks. forward to having a lot more people come through. Absolutely. All right, we're going to send it back to Kale now. Kale? Shauna, some of these signs harken back to a specific place in time. For example, this is the Stardust, and it's 1960s era atomic fonting logo. You ever wonder what goes into the coloring, for example? Well, Petronia Poonswang introduces you to a man who admits that he never knew at the time that he'd play such a major role in lighting Las Vegas. Well, so that, here, yeah. I thought, was one of the best signs that ever went up. 72-year-old Buzz Lemming is taking time to reminisce. And I remember looking at the lights and thinking, my God, you know, what, a, what an amazing thing this is. The lights once shined from these vintage neon signs now spread out in their final resting place at the Neon Boneyard. <laughs> breaks my heart to see all this stuff that used to be up that's not up anymore. Lemming has a reason to be nostalgic. He once dreamt up quite a few of these signs and then helped bring them to life. I've done the Las Vegas Club at the Fremont Hotel, the Coin Castle. I did the Western Ho and the Barbary Coast. Uh, the Rio, the, the, uh, the New Orleans. At his home, Lemming laid out the renderings he's kept That's over gone. the years of the neon signs now etched forever into Las Vegas history. These were mostly done with just a felt tip pen, you know, color markers. But anytime you see these, this type of stuff, that's all hand done. It's obvious Lemming had talent and he loved to draw, a passion he's had since he was a little boy. His father, Joe, was an artistic inspiration. My dad was a pretty talented guy, and I guess I inherited his art abilities. Abilities that caught the eyes of a local neon design firm when Lemming was just 22. He was hired on as a full-time artist and never looked back. Uh, I was real, real lucky, actually. Uh, I got in at a great time when uh, the sign business was going completely bonkers. Up and down Las Vegas Boulevard, Lemming's vision, along with those of other legendary sign designers of the 50s and 60s, became an iconic part of Las Vegas. This was just part of a concept for the frontier. Lemming and his design team also changed the face of downtown Las Vegas, giving beautiful facades to properties like the Fremont Hotel, whose sign was meant to be as eye-catching as possible. It's got a jillion feet of neon on it, <laughs> and it's all hot pink and orange, and it's just garish as you can get, but that's what the customer wanted. And what customers want, they get, especially when their name is synonymous with the mob. When we were working on the Stardust, we did have some meetings with Frank Rosenthal. Yes, as in Frank Lefty Rosenthal, a man Lemming said was a stickler for details, especially when it comes to his properties on the Strip. So they had their input on what they wanted to see in the Very definitely, <laughs> and you listened. <laughs> Lemming retired from the sign business in December of 2011, just three months shy of celebrating 50 years behind the drawing board. It's been a great career. Gee, I'm getting teary-eyed. <laughs> An artist looking back on a legacy he left behind for Las Vegas and the world to see. It's just pretty amazing. There's no place else like it on Earth. Petronia Poonswan, 8 News Now. And Lemming's son works in the business, working as a sign installer. In fact, he had a role in setting up almost all of these signs that you see here in the Neon Boneyard. Once the signs were installed, somebody had to make sure the lights stayed on. So check this out. These metal rods here, they were actually used as a ladder. Someone would climb up them to replace the bulbs, and sometimes they'd have to climb over 180 feet above the Las Vegas Strip. That's impressive, and these signs which once lit up the Las Vegas Strip are now gracing coffee table books and magazine covers. We'll show you how families here and across the country are making their own lasting memories with this old neon and how it has turned into a moneymaker for the museum. might not know about the Neon Boneyard, it's the perfect place to host an event. From having a wedding to a corporate function, it's really a great place to get that Las Vegas feel. Yeah, and you know, people who want to commemorate special events can get that feel as well. You can bring in a professional photographer for engagement portraits, wedding shots, or family portraits. We've got Lauren Rosella to show us how. Go ahead and spin her. It's hard to capture in words what makes Vegas feel like Vegas. So photographer Mindy Bean does it in pictures. You can take it from anywhere from pinup to 
um, classical of like the 1950s, you know, you get it all here. Mindy helps couples from all over the world capture their love in front of vintage signs. May and Jim flew in from New York just to shoot here, looking for something uniquely Sin City. Just the uh, iconic, you know, images of Vegas, um, things that we've always seen in the movies and film. Pose for pose, photographers use the colorful backdrop of neon signs to tell the story of a couple, but also of another time. We wanted something that was classic Vegas, that really made us um, go back in time, this sort of very nostalgic uh, location. Using things like the old frontier sign or the front of the La Concha, Las Vegas photographer Scott Jason says the museum provides a very special medium. The neon boneyards. Uh, it's a different place, you can't get this anywhere else. Jason says with couples looking to set themselves apart, the boneyard creates an opportunity for photos that are all their own. Doing pictures here is is, is going to be different than, than, you know, anything you could possibly have shot anywhere else in the country. There you go. In her time shooting at the boneyard, Mindy has discovered some of her favorite locations to shoot. One stands out in particular. Um, it's probably the Sassy uh, Saloon sign the colors in the red that pops through it. It was also a favorite for May and Jim, looking for an engagement photo that takes them back in time. And just the color and the names, and it just brings back a lot of uh, memories, I guess. Memories of a bygone era. While the signs used to take center stage, lighting the way into casinos, they're now the perfect backdrop for love. Lauren Rosella, 8 News Now. Something to keep in mind, this is no cheap venture. It starts at $400 to shut the boneyard down, for example, like a photo shoot, but taking a tour is much more affordable. The Visitor Center is open Monday through Saturday from 9.30 in the morning till 5 at night. Guided tours of the boneyard are available every half an hour on those days starting at 10 a.m. Tickets are $18 for adults 12 and over. Students, veterans, seniors over 55, and Nevada residents get in for $12 with an ID. Children six and under are free. Thank you for letting us take you on your first tour of the Neon Boneyard. We uh, hope it sheds some light on the history of Las Vegas casinos and hotels that put really Las Vegas on the map. And don't forget that you can see some of the old signs refurbished and all lit up along Fremont Street in downtown. The Boneyard does not light up, so those rehab signs are really spectacular. There's so much more to see at the Boneyard and the Visitor Center, so make sure you schedule a tour. Have a great night.